Okay, well, welcome. This is the official start of the lecture recital. Uh, just a little bit of background. I took a fantastic musicology class with um, our former chair of musicology here at the University of Miami by the name of Deborah Schwartz Cates. She taught a musical musicology course on uh, Brazilian and Argentinian music. And it was a really great class. Uh, she liked my term paper for the class a lot, suggested that I should present it as my lecture recital. And I thought that sounded like a great idea. So um, the paper is with me, actually, after the recital. If anybody wants to peruse the paper, or if anybody wants me to send a copy of it to them electronically, if they're interested in reading it, it's about 14 pages long. And uh, you know, it's about the history and the role of the seven string, nylon string guitar in Brazilian choro. Uh, we're going to start with our first piece. It's called Volvivendo, composed by Pichinguinha.
that's a classic, Bovivendo. That's um, definitely a standard within the genre. So um, this music emerges from a uh, pretty uh, diverse cocktail of influences. And um, we need to set the stage a little bit with the, uh, the climate in Brazil. Um, not literally the climate, but the social climate, the cultural climate in Brazil in the late 1800s. Um, uh, slavery was abolished in Brazil uh, pretty much like later than anywhere else. As far as I know, it was the latest country to abolish slavery uh, in 1888. And so like the Africans were still be, being imported from the west coast of Africa as late as 1888 and probably legally beyond then. You know, so the, the influx of West African immigration to South America continued longer there, you know, and uh, consequently the, the, the footprint of those, you know, those African traditions, uh, you know, is, is very, is very strong, you know, in, in Brazil, um, I mean, as it is across the Americas, but, uh, but there's the, a fresh influx of that, that music and those rhythmic influences right up until, you know, uh, pretty much the turn of the century. So that's, that's very strong. Uh, if you look at the PowerPoint, um, you'll see that uh, we have the Afro-Brazilian Lundu, which was, uh, which was a dance, uh, kind of a 2-4 two, two kind of thing going on uh, with a lot of syncopation and stuff. So that's, that's something that plays into this. And, um, concurrently, there's a lot of European immigration. Obviously, the, the language of Brazil is Portuguese, and the Portuguese are you know, the predominant European influence. But uh, through, throughout the late 1800s, there's just uh, people pouring in from all over Europe, uh, Italian, German, um, Polish, Russian. The, the influences are really quite diverse. So, so all the different you know, social dances of Europe that were prevalent at the time are also in the, in the picture here. Um, and so uh, a few of them are listed there. We got polka, waltz, uh, schottisch, the quadrille. And um, Modinha is, is something that's kind of already a cocktail of these different, that these different influences blended together. Um, and uh, so, you know, within Modinha, you know, that's, as, as often happens with genres, the terms become kind of broad. It's hard to delineate what exactly is included within the term of one genre, and then it splinters into subgenres and stuff. So within Modinismo, uh, Modinismo we have uh, Polka Lundu, uh, Tango Brasileiro, Machiche, right? And, and out of that, the choro kind of come, starts to come into focus from all these different styles that are, all these different subgenres that are floating around. The choro really comes into focus as, as a thing. And uh, something that's very important in bringing the choro into focus is uh, the, develop, uh, the development of radio and, uh, and microphones. And radio dissemination of music um, you know, throughout Rio de Janeiro really sets the stage for this music to come into being from the ingredients that are there and that are prevalent already. So we have the shoro, and then the shoro, you know, a, a lot of times when people ask me what it is, I say, well, if bossa nova is the child, then samba is the father, and then the shoro is the grandfather. You know? um, sorry, that's a little paternalistic, I guess. It could, could be the grandmother. But, um, but uh, anyways, uh, the, uh, yeah, that, so, but you know, it's, it's, it's the lineage is a little, it's not quite that direct because, you know, the samba really starts to lean towards the percussion and stuff, but the, the rhythms in the shoro, as, as we'll, we'll examine a little bit more, more closely a little bit later on, you know, really kind of give, you know, start, start to birth those samba rhythms. They kind of evolve out of those polka-like syncopations that are taking place. Um, yeah, and so, you know, so this is just kind of a little diagram of some of the heritage of Brazilian styles. It certainly isn't complete, but uh, you know, it, it uh, gives you a general idea. Um, so that's, that's about the music, the shoro, the shoro itself, um, about this instrument, about the seven-string guitar. The seven-string guitar was, uh, was prevalent in Europe, um, you know, into the 1800s um, and started to get supplanted, you know, became more and more rare in the sixth string, really became, you know, much more standard. But it held out in Russia. And it held out in this, uh, in a style of gypsy playing that, um, that involved an open D tuning. It was very much a folk style. So uh, this is somewhat speculative. Um, as I was doing reading on the subject, going back to, uh, to books about early Brazilian music, um, no one was really quite willing to stick their neck out and say definitively, 
those seven string guitars attributed to Russian gypsies. But that's, that's widely thought to have been the reason why this instrument that was come, becoming more scarce in Europe all of a sudden pops up with, uh, you know, with like a lot of presence um, on the other side of the Atlantic. So, uh, so yeah, there's this, this Russian gypsy style of, of folk playing in drop, in drop D, open D tuning on the seven string guitar. And um, the thought is that maybe that's, you know, that's who brought it and that's who, you know, contributed this instrument to, uh, to this style of music. So that's a, that's a picture of one there. As you can see, it looks a little bit different from, you know, the, the modern, modern iteration. Um, there's also uh, some theory that, that uh, Gypsy Diaspora, the Romani Diaspora, contributed to the Shoro stylistically as well. Um, the form of the Shoro typically uh, is A-A-B-B-A-C-C-A, -A -A -A, um, and then sometimes that'll be extended for improvisation or if there's a large jam session and there's a lot of people present trying to get involved in playing, you know, they'll stretch out the tune to make sure everybody gets to play. Um, but that's generally the form. You have an A part, which is the, the main melody. The B part often goes to the relative minor, and the C part often goes to the parallel, um, parallel either major or minor. Um, or other common modulations would be the four or the five, but that's, that's pretty much the form of those tunes. You can also find a lot of, uh, a lot of gypsy music that has that form, you know, so they, uh, there's, I found an article uh, when I was doing this research that was entitled, There's Something Gypsy in the Choro, and it was discussing to what extent the, uh, the Romani diaspora, which you know, began all the way over in India, came across Persia, came through Europe, you know, over to Western Europe, down into Spain with flamenco, that that diaspora actually continues into Brazil and uh, you know, is, is one of the uh, elements in the, in the cocktail of things that makes up the Choro. So, um, that was one of the most fascinating things for me uh, in conducting this research because I'm very much a fan of a lot of other styles that result from that, uh, from that diaspora. Uh, this man, uh, Mr. Villalobos, is uh, one of, considered one of Brazil's major composers. And uh, I think in a sense he could be likened to George and Ira Gershwin here in the States for taking this music that was a music of the people and a music of the street and dressing it up for the concert hall. Um, and uh, you know, he was uh, renowned as a very adept multi-instrumentalist, wrote a lot for the piano, but also wrote a lot for the guitar. And his works are uh, standard, standard study for um, you know, uh, classical guitar. Uh, and so I'm going to play an excerpt. I'm not gonna play the whole piece due to time constraints, but I'm gonna play an excerpt of one of his compositions that demonstrates how the choro can be played um, on solo guitar without the uh, without the involvement of the entire ensemble. <laughs> Mr. Alex Brown on the violin. Thank you. 
It is what it is. So uh, this gentleman is um, Pishinginya, uh, fantastic name. Um, he, he, is really, uh, he is really the protagonist of the genre, I would have to say. Uh, he uh, is most famous for Tico Tico Na Fuga, which, is, which has made its way to being an international instrumental standard, kind of a pretty virtuosic showcase piece. Um, but he wrote so many of these things, uh, and, and uh, the melodies are very angular and syncopated and, and very cleverly put together. Each one is like a little brain puzzle. He, he wrote so many of these things. I actually have the book up here if anyone wants to look at it at the end of the recital. There's a book compiled of his compositions that's uh, standard fare for, for study of music in, in Brazil. Um, so Pichinguinha was uh, primarily a flautist, and um, he was became quite famous performing on the radio, broadcasting across Brazil uh, from, uh, from Rio. And uh, that's you know, where, where he kind of carved out his niche. He traveled to Europe and uh, picked up the saxophone while he was there and became very fond of that instrument. So um, he uh, ended up selling the rights in a time of economic hardship. He ended up selling the rights to his compositions to Benedito Lacerda, who was a close friend and collaborator. And uh, Lacerda took over as the flautist of the group. And Pichinguinha moved over to the saxophone and just would basically play obligatos to all his own melodies that he would compose. He, he basically, he wrote, he wrote the melodies, he handed them over to his buddy and said, okay, now check this out. You know, started, started playing this really cool counter melodic stuff against, uh, against these tunes. Um, and this is significant because the, the style of playing this seven string guitar with all the contrapuntal improvisations uh, against the melody uh, is credited to be derived from his saxophone playing after he moved over from the saxophone to uh, from the flute to the saxophone. Uh, the there were two uh, seven string guitarists that worked uh, in his ensemble, um, which was called Oito Batutas, and um, they, I think they kind of, as many gigers do, they sort of tag teamed covering all the gigs and stuff. There are, there are these two guys. I don't think they often played at the same time, but uh, Artur Tute de Susa Nascimento and Ottavio Cina Viana. Um, these were the two guys that were holding down the seven string guitar. The, the ensemble often included a six string guitar as well, which would also be playing some contrapuntal content and playing chords more whereas the seven string was really covering the low end of the group, the seven string and the uh, bass from the pandero would be uh, filling out the low end. So uh, these, these two guys pretty much were just holding it down with roots of fifths, you know, on, on beat one and beat two. Um, and uh, the uh, six string guitarist was a guy who eventually came to be known as Dino Secicordas, which was Dino of the seven strings. He was the six string guitar player in the ensemble in its, in its early incarnation. And when, when uh, these two other guitarists, um, Artur and Ottavio, retired, they were a bit older, uh, Tino moved over to take over the seventh string. And so this guy is really uh, considered to be the, the founder of the modern style of playing with all the contrapuntal movement. And everything. Um, when asked where he got his style, where he got uh, you know, his, uh, his inventions on the instrument, he pointed to Pichinguinha and said, well, it's all stuff that Pichinguinha plays on the saxophone. I've just been, I've just been copying him, basically. And uh, Pichinguinha, in turn, when asked where he got his uh, counter melody ideas, pointed to his, uh, his mentor, who was the Ophiclide player. Raise your hand if you know what the Ophiclide is. Right, okay, yeah. Um, so uh, the Ophiclide is a low brass instrument that uh, is similar somewhat in, in shape to a serpent, but it has valves, as a, you know, a, a valve system. Um, and uh, so I guess the Ophiclide was pretty prevalent. Uh, there's, a, there's a parallel here between the transition from the tuba to the upright bass in, the, uh, in, in early jazz in the New Orleans to uh, the low brass in Brazil where the Ophiclide used to hold down these bass lines, these, these counter melodies. And that role passed over through Pichinguinha to the low strings um, on the uh, seven string guitar. So it's an interesting lineage there. Um, 
while I was down in Rio and trying to get into the style of playing a little bit, I picked up some books. Um, this is one of the better books I came across, just entitled Uvialan de Sechicuanas. And uh, it has a bunch of etudes and exercises. I wanted to put this slide up to show you, uh, you know, the nature of some of these um, nature of some of these ornamentations. Uh, the ones on this page show a pretty good variety of subdivisions. So we're we're arriving into the root or a chord tone of the chord. Uh, you know, on beat one most of the time. And it's really uh, a system of different anacruses, of different lengths, different subdivisions. You can see that first one there is, uh, you know, quite dense, uh, very, you know, a lot, lot of uh, very dramatic flourishing scale runs, you know, covering, you know, an octave or more of the scale at times, uh, sometimes with a lot of rhythmic density and getting to that root on the beat. This isn't a tune, this is just an etude this guy wrote to, you know, to demonstrate um, you know, the, the tendencies of the instrument. So you'll see we, we've got 30 seconds some of the time, 16th, 16th note triplets. Sometimes they'll leave off the first, uh, the first of the beat. You'll see uh, down at the bottom of the first page there, the 30 second notes with the, uh, with the first omitted. So you know these are these are the kinds of uh, rhythmic things I aspire to as I've been uh, trying to absorb some of this style of accompaniment. This is Jacob de Bendelin. He's another one of the noteworthy composers. Um, today we are featuring featuring Mr. Alejandro Elizondo on the mandolin. Mandolin is only two letters removed from bandolim. If you swap out the first M for a B, and you swap out the last N for an M, you have bandolim, which is, what's that? Oh yeah, I know, just about, just about. And uh, commonly the bandolim uh, is in five courses of two strings. So it's, it's uh, the, mo the most common iteration of the instrument you see is a 10 string. Um, often with an O hole instead of F holes, like that mandolin has. And that's, that's one of the prevalent instruments of, of choro. The violin, the flute, the, the bandolim, the cavaquinho, which uh, unfortunately is not here today. But uh, those, are, those are the melody instruments. The clarinet also actually is, is, is pretty common. Um, so uh, Jacob de Bandolim uh, was a very famous, uh, famous player and composer. And um, this, in this picture, he's only got eight strings, but, uh, but I think uh, there's definitely recordings out there where you can hear that lower register on the instrument. And um, this next piece we're gonna play is entitled Santa Morena. And this is an example of something within the genre that is in 3-4.
And that's, that's the chart for that one. I meant to have that up while we were playing it, so you could look at it. Yeah. Uh, so, one thing that's uh, an important factor in this music, as it is in all music, is the time feel and the way the, uh, the, way the beat is divided up. And uh, since a lot of this music is based in 16th notes, um, in terms of learning to play this music, a big part of the task for a, a non-Brazilian native is to start to absorb the way those 16th notes lope, the way they, the way they feel. They are asymmetrical in a unique way. Um, and you know, just, as, just as swing is asymmetrical in a unique way. Um, I am uh, staunchly of the opinion that, that learning to play percussion is very important for all musicians. You know, learning to play a ride cymbal is very important for a jazz musician. Uh, likewise, learning to play some of the Brazilian percussion instruments is very important for anybody who's looking to really internalize the style. Um, a point that I'd like to make about the, uh, about the time feel in this music is that uh, the physical manifestation of the rhythms on some of the instruments is uh, everything in terms of understanding how the beat is divided up. The physical action of playing the pandero and the tambourine in particular, um, because there's a left-hand rotation involved in the way the instrument is sounded, that, that the physics of, of the way those rhythms are produced on the instruments really uh, you know, um, lends, to the, lends to what the feel is. So Mr. Brian Potts, uh, also uh, a doctoral scholar from the University of Miami with emphasis on the pandero, is going to uh, give a little bit of a demonstration on the, on the pandero of the technique. And you can, can observe how the time feel in this music and the way the 16th notes lope emerges from the way this thing is played. So, um, sure. So when, um, when teaching this instrument, when I first started to learn, the first thing everybody shows you is how to play the right hand, uh, which is thumb, toe, heel, toe, thumb, toe, heel, toe. And you spend a good amount of time just trying to get that coordination down. You can do that on any surface, whatever. But the real trick of the instrument is learning how to move the left hand. So in a shorto style, uh, especially, there's a big emphasis on the E. So you have this kind of like contrary motion movement between the two hands. So on the toe motion of the E, you have a really big lift in the left hand. As far as phrasing goes, it's, it's almost as if you're trying to turn that second 16th note into the second triplet. You know, you're trying to turn it into that second triplet and kind of condense those last three 16th notes so they give kind of this more triplet esque feel. And it's one of those things that's like when it's slow, it's almost the exact opposite of like swing feel on ride because when it's slow, there's almost no lilt to it all. But the faster you go, the more. triplet kind of thing is in there. Uh -huh. So uh, that's a fun one. And then tambourin is a similar instrument in that it's you know, based on a two-handed motion. Uh, the right hand pattern is really just this. <laughs> and then you turn your left hand over to kind of get in the way so that the hand really just happens as you're pulling back up the grid. And because of the bounce of this thing, there's kind of a natural you know, lilt to it as well too. But I think really all of this stuff com comes from Candomblé. And there's a swing in that music as well too that uh, is there regardless of what instrument or you know, what implement you're playing with. Whether you're playing with your hand, whether you're playing with your sticks, da, da da da. So I think like the execution of it for sure gives it that, but I think the intention for that execution, the intention for that idea, comes not from the motion itself, but actually comes from the phrasing and kind of blend. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. So um, you know, I, I uh, strongly advocate anybody 
who decides to get involved in this style of music, uh, you know, get yourself a pandero and and uh, you know sit and spend some time, you know, playing it along with some records, because when you start to get the fizz, I'm, I'm, I've, I have one of I've been lent one by uh, by uh, Professor Potts here, and uh, been working on that a little bit, and as you start to you know experience the the physical motion of, of creating that groove when you go back to your string instrument it's you know it's internalized all that much more and it makes it uh, makes it a little bit uh, easier to uh, to get inside that time field uh, gentlemen let us take due to the climate in here uh, let us take a little uh, tune-up uh, before we play our next selection In 2010, I had the privilege of going to Brazil and participating in a workshop with the legendary Hermeto Pascual. And there was a, uh, a side workshop there. The, the Hermeto workshop took up, took up three or four hours of the day. There was some of the day left over, so they had a couple of excellent musicians there um, getting people who were uninitiated into choro. And uh, that was presided over by a, an excellent seven-string guitarist named Alessandro Panesi and an uh, American violinist who had moved down there by the name of Ted Falcon. Uh, this next tune, Ahanka Topo, is something that they uh, had for the, for the class down there. Um, not necessarily a standard, really, a, kind of an a interesting piece of rep. Uh, and this one uh, yeah, will we'll feature pretty much the whole band, I mean, pudding. So uh, without further ado, Ahanka Topo. So, uh, Choro, um, 
took a little bit of a decline in popularity in Brazil um, and is experiencing a, a bit of a renaissance in Brazil and beyond. But uh, as Choro gave way to um, other styles, um, it really left its it really left its mark. And I think um, you know when when comparing uh, harmony in American jazz to Brazilian music, one of the main differences you see is that the chord inversion is more frequently included as part of the chord changes. Um, Generally, we've got a lot of similar content. We've got the chords in the key. We've got secondary dominance. We have the tritone substitutions of those secondary dominance. We have chords borrowed from other modes to a certain extent, especially the, the parallel minor. Um, but you know, one of the things that, that we see uh, rather a lot of is that the chord changes you know, have inversions. And, and that uh, really demonstrates to what extent this instrument carried the low end. You know, in the, in the formative time of a lot of those those musical styles that, that grew out of the of the choro, um, and uh, I think the the contrapuntal nature of the instrument really lent to that tendency in, in Brazilian harmony. So, so for young guitarists who are you know jazz guitarists who are trying to interpret Brazilian music uh, authentically in the context of jazz, uh, in terms of understanding harmony and progressions. Studying this instrument and its role, and, uh, and the, the ways that the uh, melodic motion in the bass can really carry and enhance the tune as the other melody is, is really pivotal to understanding you know how to play uh, authentically. Uh, so if you know if you look if you look down this chart, you'll see you know a lot of places where the bass movement is prescribed in the chord change, and it's not that that's not also common in American jazz, but Really, you, you find in these tunes that it's it's uh, ubiquitous. Uh, if you look at the B section here, you know there's there's a lot of line cliches, and essentially, you know that's that's the role of this instrument is to provide the other melody to provide a, a complementary melody um, to the uh, principal melody of the tune. Um, going forward with the history of the guitar, so. Um, just as the, the development of radio dissemination and airplay, radio dissemination of music really set the stage for Choro to become a very popular art form. And as microphones enabled the string instruments to take over the role of the low brass, providing the bass for the ensemble, um, those techno technological developments really shaped the way the instrument evolved. The next big one that had a really big impact was the transition from, ni from gut to nylon. And in the tropics, uh, gut strings did not hold up particularly well. They didn't last very long. They would, they would start to fall apart and lose their intonation. Um, so when nylon strings you know, uh, came online and became readily available and uh, you know, they increased in quality and stuff, that's really when this instrument uh, got transitioned to nylon strings. Initially, the, uh, the seven string guitar was usually strung with steel and the players uh, typically would wear this dedero, which is a, a thumb pick. Uh, I'm getting used to it myself both for playing dobro and banjo, but also on, on this instrument, getting the feel for putting this, this pick over my thumb and you know, using that to get a more percussive articulation with the low end of the guitar. It also come from the wrist a little bit. There's the dedero. Uh, that was a, a part of the history of the instrument for you know, the first several decades of its use. Um, so this fella I have up here, uh, Luis Otavio Braga, um, was uh, more famous as an educator of the guitar than necessarily a player, but he is credited with the transition from steel strings to nylon strings on the Visual Energy Sex of Cordas. And um, I, apparently his motivation was uh, to better match the sound of the six string. Um, because I think people people were putting nylon on the six string guitar before the seven. The, the nylon had made it over to uh, the six string, but the seven string was still strung with steel for some period of time. And in a desire to match the timbres of the two instruments better, uh, Braga commissioned the first nylon string uh, seven string guitar. Uh, he was uh, again famous as an educator. He was close friends with uh, this next artist. Rafael Rebello, and Rebello um, is uh, 
pretty pretty much the ultimate virtuoso on the on the instrument. He died very young, is very tragic. He was in a car accident that was actually fairly minor, but he required a blood transfusion. And this was in the this was in the nineties. Uh, he was early nineties. He was infected with HIV in the hospital uh, while receiving a blood transfusion for some injuries that were relatively minor. So a uh, tragic loss of, uh, of really, uh, you know, one of the most fantastic guitarists that Brazil ever produced. Um, he was close friends with uh, Otavio Braga and um, uh, pretty much once Braga had his seven string nylon, Rebello was on board. <laughs> so, okay, I'm, I'm moving over to that as well. Uh, some people still play the nylon with the didero. It's pretty common, but uh, a lot of people also, you know, uh, just play with the keratin that grows off the end of their thumb. You'll also see um, later on, uh, if the uh, if the gods of PowerPoint are with me, you will see uh, a piece by Yamandu Costa, in which you'll see he has a big piece of acrylic glued onto his thumb. That's uh, that's another alternative. Um, but yeah, so so. Rubello, definitely one of the very influential players here. Going back a little bit farther, this is uh, Garoto, which translates to kid. And this is another uh, young virtuoso who, who uh, left us way too early uh, due to health issues. Um, I like to think that this is my spirit animal because whenever you see a guy sitting in a room with this many string instruments around him, you know, We've, we've found a kindred spirit of Nicholas Petunas. But uh, as you see here, we have, we have some sort of, we have some sort of uh, dobro, some sort of resonator derivative. Um, he's here in this next one with uh, banjo, cavaquinho, I mean, goodness knows what else. I, I'm not even sure I can name all those instruments. And then uh, he has a, he's sitting with an electric lap steel on his lap, so. So uh, yeah, so anyways, Garoto, and, and he, he, uh, he was a composer as well and, um, uh, left a legacy of a lot of great show pieces for the guitar. Uh, when I was in Brazil taking lessons, uh, a couple of the better guitarists I got to sit with um, uh, mentioned independently of one another that if you really want to get your technique together for this instrument, that you should play a piece called Desvirada, um, which uh, is a work in progress for me. Mr. Uh, Professor Rafael Padron and I were looking over that a little bit. But we're going to listen to um, we're going to listen to Rafael Rebello uh, play this one. Um, I, I'd like to uh, I'd like to point out that um, 
uh, Rebello took an interest in and began studying flamenco as well. And uh, you'll notice that he incorporated some of those strums, some of the rajayo that is uh, part of flamenco guitar technique where the fingers are moving downward across the strings. When I, when I first uh, began studying this music, uh, I was given a, a pointer by, uh, by a teacher that now we pretty much just pluck. The fingers don't really go the other way so much. Um, Robello introduced those techniques and a lot of modern players have really started embracing that. You know, so you will definitely see somebody emphasize a chord or a rhythmic passage you know, with, with strumming, with downward strumming, often downward strumming with multiple fingers as you would see you know, in, in flamenco guitar technique. Um, one of the uh, virtuosos of the current time period is uh, Yamandu Costa. And uh, you'll see in this, in this next performance that uh, he definitely incorporates some of those uh, right hand strumming techniques and, and just very varied technique on the guitar in general. He's incredibly expressive and, and will, uh, will take us through several different emotional states in the course of this piece titled Orejero. Mandu seems to be enjoying herself. Um, by the way, that is the, uh, the ending from a minor swing that he just played there back to the uh, something gypsy in the chord. Uh, um, for those listening to or viewing the lecture recital um, later on, I uh, apologize for the lack of volume. We had some issues with the film projector and the computer needed to be positioned differently, so the audio from the PowerPoint is not coming through the speaker. So if you're listening to this later and it seems like there is a lull in conversation, you understand what took place. Uh, this, uh, this fine man is Alessandro Panesi, and he uh, was my first teacher within this style uh, at, that, at that workshop. So. Um, Up where we have to jump. These are out of sync. These are these are out of sync.
pardon the technical difficulties, that was Alessandro Panezzi performing a, a duo version with a Cavaquinho player, but there were two of them playing at the same time. One always hopes the gods of PowerPoint will smile upon their presentation. <laughs> what, what was it that, uh, that uh, the engineer said a moment ago is, is he didn't get the update at Squid. <laughs> What's the update called? It's called, uh, as soon as you're about to present, it's called challenge mode. Challenge mode, right. Yeah. Yeah. Curveballs it goes to the, the update takes PowerPoint into challenge mode automatically. <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. So um, we're going to, speaking of challenge mode, yeah, we're, we're going to uh, move into the uh, final piece of the program, which is entitled Uma Cero. And uh, this is, uh, this is a lively, um, a lively one. And uh, I chose this because allegedly the title of this refers to the score in a soccer match. And as this is the uh, final piece I will be performing as a doctoral student, and what really comes next in life is watching the World Cup. I thought that this would be an appropriate uh, last number. Uma zero.
Thank you very much. Um, oh, the, ba the band, uh, Brian Kennard on the flute. Alejandro Elizondo on the mandolin. Alex Brown on the violin. Brian Potts on the pandero and Bruce on the tambourine. And I'm Nick Petuminis with the uh, violon Giuseppe Cordas. <laughs> Thank you to uh, Julia and Miles for staffing the event and working through the uh, technical challenges inherent in an old building. And um, Mr. Andres Daza for, uh, for running sound and recording and running video. And, uh, and most of all, thank you to my fantastic mentor, Mr. John Hart, for five really awesome years. It's been a transformative experience. And uh, yeah, well, we'll be seeing you soon to play some bluegrass. Yeah. Um, with that, uh, we have a few minutes left over to open the lecture recital to questions that I will answer to the best of my ability. Uh, with the tambourine, is that rhythm the same? Is that where this mandolin rhythm that you guys have shown here for the shoto comes from? Does it come maybe from the tambourine or a specific instrument when they just yeah, like I guess both of you guys. Yeah. yeah, I feel like it's very much the same. It's the same principle. So this is this is kind of an aside from the violin just that you caught us, but uh, uh, there's a strumming pattern that that I as a North American find very challenging. <laughs> I know I'm still trying to get this, still trying to get this down, but. Um, Basically, the sixteenth are sixteenths are played down, uh, down, down, up, down, 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 up, down, 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 up, down, 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 up, down, 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 up, um, and the uh, the middle one of those downs uh, is muted by the left hand. The left hand lets the chord off so that the chord on the downbeat is uh, is, is muted. So let's see as if I was going to have like. Uh, Sorry, the uh, uh, the um, the upstroke is on the is on the is on the E is on the second sixteenth. So it's uh, the 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 last down is the one that's muted. So the upstroke is on the E, and then the and and the uh are the downstrokes. So. Uh, I would expect that it does. I mean, you know, and, and so that's so that that, that rhythm, specific. especially yeah, right, right, and and I mean, it, yeah, it really it really lines up with the way the beat is divided in those other percussion instruments. And you, you really that's that's the way the bandolim comps as well. But really, you hear that rhythm very much in the cavaquinho, and uh, there's a whole virtuosic thing that happens with that. They play with a pick that's a little bit thin. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of floppy, and it has this this little notch out of it that I guess allows the finger to sit in there. That's a technique I haven't started exploring very much, but they get into some very dense rhythmic subdivisions. And, and the cavaquinho, you know, um, occupying the higher register of the frequency spectrum, definitely acts like a pitched percussion instrument a lot of the time. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I, I can't say for certain, but I would expect that the evolution of that style of playing has direct derivation from the percussion instruments, yeah. Can I follow my third? Uh, yes, absolutely. So I don't think so much that it's like somebody learned how to play tambourine and then was like, oh, I'm going to pick up and do it on bandolin and do the same thing. I think it has much more to do with just a general mode of playing and thinking about either two hands or two sides of, you know, downstroke, upstroke, da, da, da. Because, like, just in the percussion world, there's, like, a hundred different variants of this thing you're talking about. Yeah. Even the two that I showed you right now, the bandolin and the tambourine, while they have the same kind of, uh, there's the same idea behind those two things, they're not executed exactly the same way. So I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, like, for example, if you watch uh, a samba player play Kaisha uh, on a snare drum, they'll play everything very right hand dominant. Where your right hand is just doing all the melody notes, your left hand is just kind of like a filler towards that. And so I think that what that speaks to is, um, you know, if you compare that to the way we play snare drum in the United States, we learn how to alternate and we learn how to play this hand just as well as this hand, so we go back and forth and da, da, da. I think it's just a different mode of thinking about the instrument. The point there is just that like, 
you don't have to get your left hand or you don't have to get the upstroke to be equal to the other thing. You just have to make it swing. And however you're going to make it swing is it's going to come out that way, you know? And so I, I think that the repeated downstrokes has more to do with just kind of like a lean towards the downstrokes and the upstrokes are kind of the weaker version of that. Now, great players obviously use the upstroke as a, you know, as, as a loud, you know, um, vibrant thing as well too, and as a flourish as well too. It's not a weak stroke for them, but if you if you watch the you know, beginners when they start to pick up the instruments, they lean towards the downstroke the same way that a uh, kaisha player will lean towards his right hand. Okay. Okay. Uh, what happened when I count off with one singer? Maybe expand on that. More, more interesting to me is why is this music in 2 4 and how does that affect the feel of the thing? It's just something I've tried to right. teach, and I don't really know exactly because I'm a folk. Yeah, well, the, the polka, okay, so this is. this is Because um, you were getting ready to count off in four acts and everything, right? No, I mean, I was hearing the three in my head, I was like, what? Oh, wait, oh, was that a three? It was supposed to be. It was. Three. I, 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 it was. It, well, it's it's in three, and I I was I was I had it running in my head like one go two, one because I felt like jumping in just one two three go was fast. But I mean that was really a result of that being I think you know. So so let me let me change my question. Okay. Talk about two four and why why just okay. some two four. Yeah. Samba and the boss nova after that, and it's not you know for us we get a chart for a samba. Right. Well, you know, how does that really affect like the way the music feels? Yeah, I, I think that feeling the music in two is is really is really important. Um, and you know, I mean, there's the um, even playing bossa nova when you're playing, say, you are conceptualizing it two four um, in sixteenth notes as opposed to four four in eighth notes, which is how it's usually written in the United States. Um, when you conceptualize it in 2-4 and you're playing quarter notes in your thumb, one of the things that helps the music feel light and buoyant, in my opinion, is to uh, play beat two a little bit stronger. It's not, a, it's not a big accent, but it's definitely, you know, a little bit stronger than beat one. So that, you know, if I was just going to play... Even that's exaggerated, really, but it's, but it's a little bit stronger on beat two, and that, that keeps it, if I, if I were just to adjust that, so beat one is stronger, it already feels heavier, it feels a little bit bogged down, right? So in, in, term, in terms of conceptualizing the music in two and how that helps the feel, I really feel like, I mean, you could count, you could just think of that as beat three, you know, and think of it, think of this as like one, two, three, four, but it just, it just seems to make more sense, it's, it's, it's almost as if you're walking, it's like one, two, and then you step heavier on, on two, you know? Yeah, it gives a little bit more, but you know what? In, in, well, it's it's pretty prevalent in the in the uh, samba, um, which which gives birth to the bossa nova. Whereas within the shoro, um, the accent on on two thing is not quite as pronounced as it becomes later in bossa nova and samba. I don't feel because I'm 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 not necessarily over here with the uh, with the low notes of the guitar playing a whole lot of quarter notes necessarily playing a lot of embellishments that arrive into the different, you know, harmonic points. But uh, it, it, the 2-4 the thing, this, this music really, I, I pulled this slide back up because it shows the different, um, you know, some of the ingredients that were present in Brazil when this music came to fruition. And these European folk dances, like for, for example, polka is, is there. So um, a pretty typical thing in, in polka would be like if I were to play like, So I'm playing the root note on one and playing the chord on the and, and then on the last 16th note playing a pickup to the next root note, right? And that's the rhythm I would play like a lot in a, in shorter as well. Right? Um, but what, where that starts to evolve in the shorter is that they stop playing that pickup note and they just play all the syncopation. So, so this became... If you start mixing those up, you'll see what that can start to turn into a samba pattern, right? Because because we got like if, if this first one is one of the ones that ends on the end, pretty pretty 
pretty soon I'm in. Right, so, so it's, it's a combination of that, um, of that polka rhythm where the syncopation is on the and, and then that rhythm which I, th I think came from the lundu, which is all the syncopations on the 16th. And the combination of those two, you put those together in different, uh, in different orders and you come up with a lot of the patterns that are pretty prevalent in samba. You know, you've, you've, got, you've got the one that's syncopated all the time and, you know, and so if you, if you start with one of those, those, with the syncopation on the and, and end with that, and do the two more syncopated ones in the middle, you have, you know, the, uh, one of the directions of the most common samba patterns. Right, and right, with, like with the sort of and a skip, skip, and boom, boom. right. I don't actually. Did that, did that come? Was that influenced by the choro originally? Those those rhythms are interesting. It has to do with the way. Right, right, right. Yeah. Right? yeah, I mean. You have, you have any thoughts on that, Brian? Or yeah, I mean, I, I, I think those those two things kind of developed concurrently as well. Concurrently. Too. Choro is definitely a little bit earlier, but like yeah. samba, there's really murky to that so it's really hard to tell exactly where they have like the first parade I think is I don't need to get the date wrong but I think it was in like the teens you know like mm -hmm. when they first started actually yeah. marching around Rio yeah. but they were playing before the instruments that. had to be around before that though. yeah, yeah. Right. but the, the instruments yeah. like the sordo is like a reappropriated uh, European bass drum like military yeah. bass drum right you know, yeah. the same thing as a bull and all that sort of stuff yeah so the polka could have had an influence yeah I think they kind of like informed each other a little bit Typically, when I, you know, if, if I'm describing, you know, the progression from choro to samba to bossa nova, you know, I, I describe samba as, as at least initially, as a move away from the instrumentation and the complexity of all the counterpoint and stuff that's going on in the choro, and more of an emphasis on the percussion instruments. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a. And samba's more of a dance. Samba's much more, yeah. Was it choro, choro dance music? Or? It comes yeah. out of those European yeah. dance music. It absolutely is danced too. <laughs> when, I, when I've when I've been out when I've been out to listen to it, the you know in, in Rio the dance floor is very full. I believe it's so, a foho. Is that, that's the foho, foho, yeah, that's that's northern that's northern Brazil, but it has a lot of similar elements as elements as well, and the strong beat too, and the yeah. you know. Um, Shoulder was less dance too. You must have gone to a big party because there's yeah. plenty of like shoulders where it's just only yeah. sit around. Yeah, yeah, well, okay. that's a party. That's yeah. a party. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but that's my, that's actually my favorite uh, music venue on planet Earth, Geosonarium. But yeah, no, I, you know, they'll, and you know, that it's, it's a Geosonarium is a three-level antique store that was uh, converted into a nightclub, but they never took out the antiques. It's a very colorful place, and uh, you can see the stage from all three levels. And, and what I've seen them do there, through they, they, it's almost like they retrace the history of Brazilian music as the night goes on, because they'll cycle through three or four different acts. And earlier in the night, they'll have you know they'll have choro, and then they'll you know they'll they'll move into you know kind of move progress forward until they start getting into some some pop and some samba funk and some samba hege and, and uh, but but yeah I mean I you know it's uh, you know and it's uh, I think the the samba I typically think of it you know it evolves a little bit later because choro was evolving before 1900. Um, and and uh, so I, the, the samba I, I typically think of being as chronologically later and moving the emphasis towards the percussion the percussion instruments. But samba definitely comes from Kamblay, and there's a specific rhythm called kabula. 